Hello, everyone. Welcome. Thanks for joining our diagnostic training session today. Now, if you have any questions throughout the session, if you're joining us on Zoom, just look at the top of the bottom of your screen. Wherever your Zoom controls are, you should see a little button that says Q&A. Click on that Q&A button, it'll open a new box. You can type in your question, hit submit, and I'll get to those at the end of the session. If you're joining us live on YouTube, uh, just make sure you go wherever the uh, comment section or the live chat is on the Zoom video or the uh, YouTube video, sorry, and uh, go in and type your question there or comments. Uh, hi, Tony, thanks for checking in. And uh, just uh, hit, the, hit those uh, questions on YouTube and I'll get to those at the end of the session as well. So my name is Jason Gabrinas. I'm one of Snap-on's national technical trainers, been in the training department the last eight years, traveling around North America, helping Texan shop owners get the most out of their diagnostic equipment. Before I did that, it was a couple of years as a diagnostic sales rep with Snap-on. So I had about 30 different Snap-on franchisees I worked with, as well as the shops that they serviced to help everyone get the most out of their diagnostic needs. Before that, it was eight years at Subaru. So I was a diagnostic technician at a Subaru dealership, or should I say became a diagnostic technician there over time. Always seemed to end up with those drivability problems, the intermittent problems, the weird wiring problems that would show up on those cars. Those would always seem to end up in my bay. So over time, those just, that just became my, my, my bread and butter, and that's, that's what I did all day. So as I said, became a diagnostic tech there. And then before that, a bunch of other miscellaneous wrenching jobs. Been a little over 25 years under hood experience for me. So today we are talking about continuing our component testing series we've been doing. And uh, we're going to talk about cooling system electronics. And you might think, oh, coolant system electronics. What do we have for cooling system electronics? Might not be a whole lot of diagnostic merit there, but, uh, you know, according to newer cars today, there's a lot going on when it comes to uh, cooling systems. So we have our usual standby engine coolant temperature sensor, right? That's, that's been around for a very, very long time, having the coolant temperature sensor, being able to control the fans and so on and so forth, and letting the computer know what the temperature is. Also, some vehicles might use a cylinder head temperature sensor. Uh, that would be a very similar way of doing things, except it's measuring the temperature of the actual cylinder head. Uh, it could be a radiator outlet temperature sensor. Any of the temperature sensors, by and large, on the vehicle are going to be what we call a negative temperature coefficient thermistor. Right? So the resistance on the unit will change as the temperature changes. Uh, so we'll talk about those. We'll also talk about the thermostat, right? We have our old standby dumb thermostats, if you want to call them that. Just they, they have no electronics involved at all. But we have new, some of the newer cars, and I say newer, really it's seven, eight years at least they've been using that. Uh, there's electronic thermostats on cars now. We'll talk a little bit about that. How about the cooling fans, right? Cooling fans aren't nearly as simple as they used to be either because sometimes we have control modules dealing with those. And then we also have the active grill shutters, which are supposed to help increase aerodynamic efficiency and also uh, change the temperature going into the, uh, the cool of the air going in through the, the radiator, right? So that is considered part of the cooling system. And then, of course, we have electric water pumps. Now, we're used to having the mechanically driven water pumps, but there are many models out there now that are electric water pumps. And there's some vehicles that have both the mechanical and an electrical water pump that runs after the vehicle shuts down. So we need to be able to test these things and check these things and a lot, awful lot of them will set codes, right? So we need to be able to go through the diagnostic uh, flow with these things. So when we think about testing these, we're gonna th be thinking about component failures on them, right? So we could have one of three ways my component can fail. So we could have our opens, so that means I have no voltage getting to the component if I have open on the voltage feed so the, that it's not getting voltage to the sensor, or I'm getting voltage to the sensor and sensor's not getting back to the computer, right? So that could be our no voltage from the component. Maybe it's coming out the component itself, but it's not making it all the way down on a wire back to where it needs to go back to the PCM. Maybe you have it open somewhere in the harness. How about a short? Right, so a short could be excessive voltage if I have a short to power. So say I'm only supposed to be five volts and it's rubbing against another wire in the harness and it's a 12 volt wire. So now I'm getting 12 volts in that is five volt circuit. So that's never good. And, and that can cause an over voltage situation. Or I could have insufficient voltage, right? If I have a short to ground, maybe it's chafing on a piece of metal on the engine or something of that nature. And it's just momentarily shorting the ground. That'll pull that voltage away and then I won't have enough voltage in order to operate. Or maybe it's internal short to ground or an internal open. 
And then, of course, we have resistance, right? We have the corrosion, the green fuzzy stuff that gets on all the connectors all the time or actual physical damage, right? Well, if I have that chafing wire again, uh, it could rub through the wire, the braided wire, but maybe I have a few strands left that are making a connection, but it's not enough to flow sufficient amperage to operate the circuit. So that would be high resistance in that line because I only have a few strands of wire to carry my signal, right? So when we're looking for a component failure, we're thinking about something falling into one of those three buckets. So we just kind of keep that in mind as we're going through the different uh, sensors and components here. So first off, let's talk about those thermistors, All right? So by and large, generally speaking, uh, when you're going to run across one of these temperature sensors, could be a coolant temperature sensor, cylinder head temperature sensor, radiator outlet temperature sensors, all sorts of temperature sensors on a vehicle. You're going to have your connector up on the top, of course. And then inside, you're going to have an element that uh, will alter resistance based on temperature. So if we look at this simplified graph on the right-hand side, uh, my temperature is here on the horizontal and my resistance is going to be on the vertical. So as the temperature increases, the resistance will decrease, right? And oftentimes a manufacturer will publish a table as to, well, at this temperature, it should be this resistance and it should be this voltage because the voltage output will change based on the resistance. And that's how the computer knows what the temperature the vehicle is. It doesn't, it can't see exactly, oh, it's 210 degrees. No, it sees X number of volts, which means it is around about 210 degrees, right? And they're not 100% accurate, but they're close enough um, where we could see that. Now, the problem you're going to have is it could be a power supply issue, open short, or it could be a uh, signal issue getting back to the computer, right? So it's only two wire sensor. Sometimes it's a three wire sensor, but oftentimes it's a two wire sensor. And the signal might just not get there, right? Could have a high input, low input, something of that nature. So for testing it, in this case, fairly simple procedure, right? So my coolant temperature sensor on this wiring diagrams right here. I have my signal wire on this line that goes back to the computer. And then I also have my voltage feed. Now, if we look at this though, this is another important point I'd like to make. Just because it seems like it's a simple sensor doesn't mean it's necessarily the simplest electronics diagnostic. Because if we look at this line right here, this black and yellow line that's highlighted, that also feeds the MAP sensor. It also feeds the NOx sensor. It feeds the engine oil temperature sensor. And in this case, it's got tumble generator valves in the intake. Uh, so those actuators are also fed by the same signal wire. And that is a five volt reference signal from the computer. So if I have a bad coolant temperature sensor or I get a code for a bad coolant temperature sensor and I go to check for my voltage and I have two volts at my five volt reference or I have one volt or half a volt or you know, whatever that's not five volts, Am I where I'm supposed to see five volts? Well, it's not gonna operate correctly anyways. It's not getting fed the proper voltage. So I'd want to take a look at this wiring diagram and see, well, what further down the line might there be a problem? So then maybe I'll check my map sensor and see if the five volt reference is low there. Probably get a code for that as well. Go back to my knock sensor. Maybe that has low voltage, but over here, my engine oil temperature sensor, well, that voltage is good. So in that case, that might mean my brake is somewhere in here past this splice or this splice or somewhere in this neck of the woods, I'd have a problem, especially if my knock sensor didn't have the voltage, right? So we wanna start at the, at the end, test it and work our way backwards and see if we can figure it out, All right? So you maybe test the coolant temperature sensor first. If you don't see five volts there, check there's five volts coming out of the computer. If there is, then maybe you have an open somewhere in the line and you just check on down the line, see what the problem is. Seen that many times where one sensor could have an internal problem in the sensor and it can be pulling the voltage out of the five volt circuit and it pulls the rest of everything else out of whack, All right? So we want to make sure that when we're looking at it, we want to double check the wiring diagram as well. Like I said, it seems like simple, but it's not always the case. Could just be, yeah, it's bad, but could also be some other problem in the system. There's a few ways we, we can test these. So we have a voltage test, and then we also have a resistance test we could do. So this is just an example here of a voltage test. If the vehicle is at operating temperature, it should be one to 1.4 volts. In this case, we were we we're a little low, so we were a little below operating temperature actually in this case. Uh, so we see that would have been okay according to where we were at. And then as far as your resistance, oftentimes you will get a temperature versus resistance table in there. Uh, so in this case, on this sensor at 32 degrees, it's 5.9 kilo ohms up to 176 degrees, you get 0.3 kilo ohms 
and so on and so forth. So if it's less than that, the temperature is higher and so on. So sometimes you get a little bit more of a table than this, but in this case we get four, All right? So we have the ECM ground and then the ECT signal as well. All right. Now let's talk about the thermostat. So those are our thermistors. Now we'll talk about our thermostat. So old school thermostat that we've been used to forever. They've been on cars for a long, long time. It's a fairly simple mechanical device. No electronics involved. So if we look on the left-hand side, that's just kind of a, a side view. We have our round circle that goes over the hole. And then we have our valve mechanism here, the spring. If we pull the cross section out, uh, there's my little gasket. In this case, it's an O-ring. And then I have my valve here that opens and closes. And in here, we have wax. So they call that a wax element. So usually it's brass on the outside and the wax is on the inside. When the wax gets hot, due to touching hot coolant, it will melt and then this valve will open and allows coolant to pass through. When it gets cooler and then the wax rehardens, it'll close back up and it'll close the hole. So it's not the most accurate thing in the world and you can have a decent range of where it opens and closes, uh, but that's what we've been using for years and years and years. It's just a simple mechanical device based on wax melting. So wouldn't you know it, a few years ago, uh, they decided, manufacturers decided, well, let's, let's improve on that. Let's improve on this simple device and let's uh, add a heater to it. So in this case, this is a electronic heated thermostat. And what they do is they have, it's, it's got you know, basically power and ground. It's usually pulse modulated and it can heat up that wax using the heater element and it'll heat it up before the coolant gets a chance to heat it up. So I can actually open it and run the engine cooler if I need to, or I can keep it closed longer and allow it to warm up faster because I could have a higher melting temperature on my wax, right? So it allows it to uh, change when it's opening versus just waiting for that wax to melt. I'll make the wax melt, right? Um, now that's one way, that's, that seems to be the most common way to see it out there. There are a few others that operate a valve, things of that nature, maybe just like a, a, a spool valve or something like that, uh, to be able to bypass coolant as well. Uh, but by and large, what I've seen anyways is this uh, heated thermostat where it's a heated element over that wax pellet and allows it to open that way. So, you know, we gotta, we gotta complicate things by putting electronics on it, right? But I guess it makes it better fuel economy and all that good stuff that they're looking for, right? Here's just an example. This is on a Mercedes C-Series. And uh, yeah, that's, uh, that's, that's, there's a lot going on here, right? So the actual heated thermostat elements over there, uh, but it comes all as a, as a big assembly with the captive bolts already there. And looks like it's got some quick connects on there, a couple of the hard lines already there. Um, so that's just simply just unplug it and plug the new one in, I guess. But there's your thermostat for this Mercedes, right? Kind of crazy to think about that. And it's also like 200 bucks. <laughs> so it's not large, it's 300 bucks, closer to 300 bucks. So uh, this just gives you a download. I went into ShopKey, or not ShopKey, and I got a component test, sorry. Got a component test on any of our tools that have a scope. You have this database of information in there. So it tells you how it works. Uh, so on this case, I'm looking up on 2012 BMW. Conventional wax thermostat is used with addition of a heater element. Thermostats will have a rated temperature, which they open to allow coolant flow to en enter the engine radiator. During normal operation in low load conditions, the coolant circulates around the engine and the internal heater radiator or the heater core. It's often referred to as a short coolant circuit. When the coolant temperature reaches the thermostat opening temperature, the wax will melt and expand. This opens the thermostat and allows coolant flow of the engine radiator. It's often too referred to as the long coolant circuit. So during high load conditions, a greater cooling effect is required. So the engine control unit uses an electric current to flow through the heater element. So it'll open it up at a cooler temperature. Causes the wax to melt before the coolant reaches a high enough temperature to open a thermostat in a conventional way. When the current is switched off, the wax solidifies again. The thermostat will close and coolant will again only flow around the short circuit. All right, so the uh, PCM controls the operation of the thermostat. Opens and closes the thermostat via heating element located through the center of the thermostat's heat sensitive spring. Then modulates the thermostat's heating element ground. More precise engine temperature control can take place. All right, so all of these things are the benefits. And then how am I going to test it? Well, you can test the pulse width. You can test the voltage on that as well. And we'll look a little bit deeper into some of these when we go live on the tool as well to see what the test would actually look like. But that's just one example. And there's, there's quite a few cars that use this element now, not just Mercedes, BMW, but you know, Chevy, Ford, 
that sort of thing as well. How about cooling fan? Cooling fan used to be pretty simple too, right? If we think about, uh, you know, the early cooling fans, they had the switch, the, the, the coolant temperature sensor would actually activate the relay to turn on the fan. Then we came into computer controls and, and the like. So in this case, on this vehicle, we have two cooling fans. Uh, one's the main fan motor to use for cooling. And then the other one's used oftentimes when the air conditioner is on. So we need that extra cooling effect on the condenser there. So simply the ECM has two controls, one for each fan. And when it does send it, it's going to ground the relay, right? Ground the coil in the relay, flips over, allows uh, current to flow, and then it will go in and turn that motor. Now, on these conventional motors, though, you might be able to do something that you wouldn't necessarily think of before now. And how about current ramping a cooling fan? Now, you may have heard about us talking about current ramping a fuel pump before, and you current ramp coils and things, but current ramping a fuel pump is very similar to uh, a, a cooling fan, except the cooling fan structured a little bit differently. So here's just an example. Took it off a standard cooling fan. Uh, with no control modules. So that's a really easy one when we have relays and things. And the difference between a cooling fan and a fuel pump is a fuel pump has fewer commutator segments in there. So most fuel pumps are going to have eight commutator segments. In the case of this vehicle, and I found it to be true on a lot of vehicles, is that's way more. So in this case, we have 20 commutator segments on this vehicle. They're a lot smaller and spread out over the, uh, the course of the fan. So how do I know it has 20? Well, I look, took a look at the pattern and found out where does the pattern repeat? So we see we have this one notch that comes up, comes down, we got this little dip right there and it comes down. And then over here, we got the same thing with the little dip right there and it comes down, right? So I'll call that number one. It doesn't really matter because it's a circle, but we'll call that number one. So if I tag that, there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10. 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20 commutator segments before it repeats again. So I want to look at the condition of the commutator segments, make sure they're all pretty even, make sure there's not a lot of noise going on, make sure none of them are missing. If any of them are missing, that's a damaged fan motor that needs a replacement. Uh, if it's got a, a lot of noise in there, that's going to need a replacement, of course. Uh, I can also check RPM. In the same way, I can check an RPM on a fuel pump. So in this case, if I know there's 20 commutators, I'll put cursor one there, cursor two there, and take my time difference. So my time delta right here is the difference. It takes, that's the time it takes to get from number one to number two. So that's one rotation we established, right? So that means one rotation on this goes 29 and a half milliseconds is how long it takes. So I could do a little math, pull up my calculator, 60,000 milliseconds in a minute, divide it by that 29 and a half, means it's turning at a little over 2,000 RPM. Sounds about right to me. Now, if I had a little tachometer gauge thing, I, I, could, I could check it and verify it, but uh, more than likely that's correct, about 2,000 RPM. The math works out anyway. Um, so that means it's going well. Now, if we're getting down to a couple hundred RPM and it's supposed to be on high, that's probably a problem. Uh, oftentimes, I mean, it's pretty simple on a cooling fan, though. If it makes noise, it's, it's probably got a shot bearing or you know, something of that nature. But if you ever took one apart, you can see the brushes and the commutators and all that. And we can test it in the same way as any other electric motor. So I thought that was kind of a neat little thing to share with you. So that's on a standard coolant, uh, cooling fan pump. Now we also have other cooling fan pumps, or actually cooling fan motors, uh, that work in a similar way. Sometimes they can be pulsed with modulated though, so that might not necessarily give you that current ramp. So here's an example. It's on a Ford Crown Vic, think like late 2010s or so. Uh, Crown Vic, and that one has an engine cooling fan module on it. Uh, so in this case, it's mounted right to the fan, and it has power, it's got ground, and then it has a variable speed signal that comes from the PCM. So the PCM, depending on, well, in this case, it's got the cylinder head temperature sensor, not a coolant temp sensor. So depending on what that sensor tells it, how hot it is, it's going to send a variable pulse width signal in here, and then judging on that, it will vary the speed of the fan. So we may have a module in the way as well. So you got to take that into consideration when you go into testing the circuit. All right, how about active grill shutters? You might think, oh, this is a body part, right? But where do they go and what do they actuate? Well, they cover up the grill, right? So here is a uh, example, little animation of some active grill shutters on a truck. And look, it covers the whole radiator. So I can open them, I can close them. There's a little actuator and a little 
little arm in there and opens them and closes them, depending on how we want to have them open or close. can change the aerodynamic profile of the vehicle, also changes the amount of airflow going through the radiator. So uh, that is definitely part of my cooling system at this point nowadays. And it only used to be on a few certain few cars. Now it's on pretty much all the cars that are out there. Most of your brand new cars are going to have some sort of an active grill shutter on there uh, to take a look at. So definitely something to be uh, diagnosing, looking forward to. Um, so here's just an example. I think this is on a Ford and uh, it's got, it's behind the left side of the front fascia and the shut uh, the actuator. So we have a fuse, we got power, simple enough, right? Power and ground. On this vehicle though, it is controlled over a LIN bus. So LIN stands for local interconnect network. That is a low speed data bus. So you'll actually see a data signal coming from the computer if you were to test it right there. So that is one of the options. And it's on a 2018 Ford Explorer. You can see we got the ground, LIN bus, and then power from the fuse. Uh, active grill shutter uses a grill shutter assembly with a grill shutter actuator. The active grill shutter system is used to maximize fuel economy by reducing aerodynamic drag on the vehicle. So it'll close it so the wind goes over. Active grill shutter system shortens the engine warm up time as well because I'll close off the shutters and then my uh, radiator won't be getting as much airflow, right? That receives position commands from the PCM and the grill shutter system carries out a calibration sequence whenever the engine is started. So it self calibrates whenever it starts. It'll fully open and close the shutters before being positioned where it is told to position, right? So it's behind the dash there. So in this case, we have a LIN bus. Another case on another vehicle, this is, uh, I think this one's a Chevy Cruze if I, if I remember. Uh, we're gonna have voltage, we're gonna have ground. And then in this case, this, the controller, it's got a logic board in the actuator. So really this is just a variable pulse with uh, signal coming from the computer in the case of this vehicle. So let's see, that is, a, oh, it's a Chevy Cruze, right? So it's a 2016 Chevy Cruze. And that one has a shutter control, which is variable pulse width, ground, and then the supply voltage on that vehicle as well. Now, I also wanted to note that I picked this page for a reason. Look for damage to the shutters from road debris or something stuck in the shutters, keeping them from opening or closing. And guess what? That'll set a code. Never would have thought that a pebble wedged in my grill shutter is going to set a code, but it can't. I actually remember saying, I forget what kind of car I was on. But I remember seeing a TSB while doing this research uh, that said, yeah, look for a rock. And sure enough, they had a picture of a pebble right inside. And it was keeping that actuator from opening. Um, so, yeah, just take a look. Visually inspect. That could be the cause of the code, right? Crazy. Crazy to think about. And our last component before we go live is we're going to talk about the electric water pump. Now, I know we're used to the uh, the normal mechanical water pumps, but to save on parasitic draw and or, or parasitic drag on the engine, uh, mechanical drag on the engine. Uh, some manufacturers have decided it's more efficient to go with an electric water pump, right? So in this case, this is off a of BMW. You can see the connector right there where the power ground and such will go. And then we just have an inlet and an outlet. It's just a simple uh, impeller there and it just rotates the water. So in this example, it's on a 2012 BMW and that was the picture we just showed there. Uh, it's used to precisely control engine temperatures. This will improve operating efficiency as well as promote cleaner emissions, which is better for everybody. Uh, it does is controlled by what we call a BSD control signal. So BSD stands for bit serial data, and that is a, another low speed data bus. Right, it's a single wire data bus with a data transfer rate of 1.2 kilobar. Uh, it'll request functions, identify data request information, as well as send component fault messages as required to the modules that need the information, right? So it has that. Uh, right to the water pump, and that's what controls it. Uh, bolts are aluminum, must be discarded, never reused. They're also a torque angle bolt, so tighten to 10 newton meters and a torque angle of 90 degrees. So if I wanted to pull up the wiring diagram on this car, we can see we got power coming down from here, and then we have ground over here, and then we have our bit serial bus, which goes right there, right? So we have our bit serial bus signal, and it goes to the coolant pump and ramps it up and slows it down and controls it and changes it based on vehicle driving conditions and what's required. So if I were to test this, power, ground, and then the bit serial bus will actually take a look at what the signal's supposed to look like, but it's supposed to be look like a square wave. All right, so we'll be able to see that as well. All right, there we go. So let's go to a live walkthrough here.
and we're going to pop up our uh, our Zeus here. All right, so let's go through a couple different vehicles, a couple different ways we can test things, and where can we get more information here. So uh, let's go into guided component test first. So if you have a Snap-on tool that has a scope, it will have guided component test in there, and that is a database that goes back to 1981, covers uh, dozens of different vehicle manufacturers. You can see them all on the screen here. But before I ID a vehicle, because it is VIN specific information, we can also go into training and classes. There are hundreds of built-in training and classes inside the tool. And there's a specific one that talks about what we're talking about tonight. So if I go in here and go to how to, 65 different categories of classes in here. One that pertains to what we were just talking about is LINBUS, right? I talked about local interconnect network, and that is uh, the low speed bus that we might use on some of these. Um, but the one that I want to talk about is in here somewhere. Uh, there we go. 15 minute mapped cooling system class. So when we're talking about these electronically controlled thermostats, we're also talking about mapped cooling systems. So some vehicle manufacturers are now using a mapped cooling system. By electronically controlling the thermostat, the engine management system can allow coolant flow through the engine radiator at a lower coolant temperature. The thermostat with a higher operating temperature can also be fitted. So it'll, this allows the engine to warm up quickly and run at a higher temperature when required. And then it gives you a rundown of a couple different methods. So we have both the electrically heated thermostat, which we talked about. And then the other, I think less common one is going to be a solenoid uh, bypass type uh, thermostat as well. So those are both in there and they both still use the wax element. It's just, they use it in a different way. So you could actually go through, read through that on the tool if you wish to do so. All right, so let's exit out of here. And now let's pull up one of my vehicles and we'll talk about a few different things we can do here. So let's go in and uh, check that Chevy Cruze first. I think that might be where that TSB was. Uh, so we go into a Chevy Cruze. I'm gonna go into my shop key. Uh, let's call it a, let's call it an LT. Okay, come in here. It's gonna load my vehicle for me. Now I'll say it's an LS. What the hell, right? Gas. Automatic. Uses vehicle. Okay. Chevy Cruze, fairly common car, right? So let me pull up my active grill shutter. Let's open that up, see what we get for information here. All right, so we get our specs, our testing, guided component testing, remove and replace. All right, so if I go into remove and replace, Visual and physical inspection, inspect for aftermarket devices and inspect easily accessible visible system components. Also look for rocks, broken things. All right, so we have that in there. Uh, wiring diagrams, we can go in and we can see how we would test that. So I can pull that up to my engine performance system, circuit two of seven. Once I open my wiring diagram, you see it's pre-highlighted and dim all the wires around it. And then I can see where it goes over here. So we got power, just gonna go to a fuse, right? There's my fuse block. And then my ECM is gonna be over here. It's gonna bring me all the way over and bring me over to my ECM as well. So it's, it's gonna help us with testing. We also have guided component testing we can do on this. So if I go into guided component tests, load my Chevy Cruze there, go into engine. And we have active grill shutter test right there as well. So we can go to component information, tells us how it works. We already actually read through this on the slides, but I could do a DC voltage test. All right, it's gonna tell me the, the voltage is gonna to toggle on and off with the chassis control module commands the shutters to move. So we'll see a positive and negative alternating voltage, uh, not alternating, but DC voltage uh, going back and forth, power to ground. All right, so we have a couple of tests we can do there. Let's go back to a couple other components, see what else we have on here. Uh, in this case, on this vehicle, we also have a heated thermostat. So like I said, it's not just on BMW and Mercedes. It's also on the Chevy Cruze right here. We have a heated thermostat. So it's going to tell us how it works. Uh, through the center of the thermostat's heat-sensitive spring, modulates the thermostat. So we can do a duty cycle test. It's going to tell us uh, should command the duty cycle to zero and hold engine RPM. Coolant temp should increase greater than 215 degrees. Temperature should decrease as duty cycle is increased. So we can duty cycle it up and down using a functional test. Signature test. It's going to be a square wave, right? As we said, it's a modulated signal. So you're going to see up and down and the frequency will change uh, over time, depending on what my pulse width is. And then an outer range of signal test is there as well. We're going to measure power and ground. 
So that is heated thermostat. Let's go into my BMW, my tried and true BMW. Got a component test engine. And uh, let's go to the water pump because this was the interesting one with the bit serial data line, right? So if I can go into component information, it's gonna tell me how it works. We already looked at that. Uh, but if I back up and go to my signature test, it's gonna show me what my serial data should look like. So it's gonna look like this. So it's not the actual control signal, it's the actual the data bus, the bits and bytes, the ones and zeros that are going back and forth on the signal there, right? So we can have our ons and offs, our ones and zeros, very easy to test. And then we can just take a look at the signal, and make sure we have that square wave as well. And it also says a good way to test this is there's an automated bleed procedure that takes 12 minutes on the car. And what it does is it cycles that pump for 12 minutes. So that gives me plenty of time to test it uh, while it's doing that. So that's just one suggestion on how to do it easy enough. You can also do a functional test to turn it on and off to test it that way as well. Right. So lots of information available in there in the guided component test. Also lots of information available in my shop key or other repair information system. Plenty of information there. Uh, there's also functional tests we can do to cycle things on and off. Uh, so definitely a lot that we can do. And I think that's probably a lot more than you may have thought was going to be contained in the coolant system as far as electrical components, right? So uh, I know I definitely learned a lot about some of the newer technology research in this one as well. So hopefully you learned a lot too. So let's go and talk about next week. So we do have classes every week, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. My classes are on Tuesday and they're always at six and nine Eastern. So if you want to join us on Zoom, you can do that by going to snapon.com slash OT and registering for the class. Or my first class at 6 p.m. Eastern, like we're doing right now, is live stream also to our YouTube channel. So youtube.com slash snap-on diagnostics. Next week, we're talking about gasoline direct injection, checking the injectors, checking the fuel pumps, a couple different systems, a couple different failures you might be able to see on there. Uh, here's a screenshot off the scope. We have an open, closed, and a current ramp on one uh, gasoline direct injector. So it is a totally different pattern that we're looking at as well. So it's a totally different way to test it. So we're going to talk all about that next week. So hopefully you can come and join us six and nine Eastern, like I said, and uh, check it out. If you're looking for any of our past classes as well, those are also archived to YouTube. So we go to youtube.com slash snap on diagnostics. Also make sure you subscribe there and make sure you ring that little notification bell next to it to make sure that you know the next time we go live or the next time we post new content because it's not just me posting content on there as well as plenty of material. Uh, so you can see everything from ADOS, data bus testing, module setup, thermal imagers, and our component testing series we've been going through the last couple of months. Uh, so all that's available to rewatch uh, at your leisure 24 seven there. And it's all free. Who else gives you uh, this much free training every week? Four nights a week and we give you a ton of free training. It's crazy, how can we do it? It's, it's amazing. So let's get to questions. I see I got a bunch on uh, on both Zoom and on uh, and on YouTube. So we'll get to those in a second. But before I do, a little commercial for my buddy Al. So Al also does training, as I mentioned earlier, and he does tool specific training, or as we'll call it, platform specific training. Uh, so on Mondays it's on Apollo, Wednesdays is on Zeus, and Thursdays it's on Triton. Uh, so he goes through everything through. Let's set up your Wi-Fi because a lot of functionality on the tool depends on Wi-Fi at this point. Go through, set up your Wi-Fi, set up your free snap on cloud account. So you can uh, send pre-scans and post-scans off to your customers and screenshots, things of that nature, all the way through. Let's run, do a rundown, code to completion on intelligent diagnostics. And how does intelligent diagnostics help me as a diagnostician fix it, help me fix a car faster and easier, right? So the a Monday class is about an hour. And then on the Zeus and Triton, the first hour is the same type of uh, subject matter. And then after a short break, go through another hour on the guided component test, the scope and the meter module on the tool there as well. So it's definitely a wealth of information. Al is a deep well of knowledge. He's been with us at Snap-on Diagnostics for over 30 years. He came over with the bricks. So Al has been with us a long, long time. It's definitely a deep wealth of knowledge. So definitely worth picking his brain as far as how the tool operates. So let's get to questions. I'm going to try and leave this up, see if I get a different thumbnail today. All right, so let's start on Zoom. We got a couple on Zoom there. 
Okay, Thomas, thank you for joining us again. It's been a little while, I think. Uh, but will the new the new VCI pod for Chrysler and Jeep Ethernet systems work on my Zeus and Varus Edge, or do I need to buy two VCI pods? So as far as I know, right now, um, the S7 module, which would be the black one, uh, should work on any Ethernet protocols that are out there. Now, it might not necessarily be active in the software yet, uh, but when we do make the update, it would be an update for the module. And so that black S7 module should be updatable to any future Ethernet protocols that'll come out. Uh, so that should work for you there, Tom. Thanks for thanks for the question there. All right, so let's look on YouTube. Got quite a fit, quite a bit going on there. Uh, Nicholas, thank you for joining. Thanks for checking in. Uh, David, same thing. Very thank you. Thank you very much for the compliments. Um, Nicholas from London, thank you very much. Uh, let's see. Uh, let's see. Winton, hi. Uh, Colin, scope it, scan it, but don't blow it, right? Don't blow it. Don't blow up your tooling. Definitely don't want that. Uh, let's see. Thank you. Thank you, Nicholas. Thank you, Naveed. Uh, next day class time. So uh, next class time for live on YouTube next week would be 6 p.m. Eastern time, whatever that is in your particular time zone there, Naveed. And of course, we do record these as well. And uh, Brandon, thank you very much for checking in there as well. Uh, any other questions? Like I said, if you're on Zoom, just hit that Q&A button. You can type in your question uh, or use the live chat function in YouTube. I'll give you another second or two because I know we got a little bit of a delay on YouTube there. Always a lot of help, folks. Mr. Gracida, I can't really diagnose your vehicle over YouTube. I'm sorry how much I'd like to do that, but I got a PL700 code and a U0100 code. Sounds like a network problem, honestly. Check your check your bus on that Chevy Silverado for a bus problem. So U, U code is always a bus problem. Uh, so definitely check that out. Oh, got another question on Zoom. Got two questions on Zoom. Thomas, thank you very much. All right, Woody, glad you enjoyed it. Thanks for attending. Thanks for checking in. And I will see you tomorrow. All right. Looks good. Colin, thank you very much. Colin from Liverpool. Thank you very much. All right. So with that, looks like we're in good shape and we've wrapped up our questions. So I would like to take the time to thank you very much. Taking time out of your busy week, out of your busy schedule to come learn a little bit more with us. Hopefully you'll be joining us next week for GDI systems as well and how we can test those. And hopefully uh, we got a little bit out of that. So it's Tuesday. Enjoy the rest of your week. Enjoy your weekend. Stay safe out there. And ooh, two more questions. All right, Thomas. Oh, Thomas is a gasoline direct injection next week. And Sean, thank you very much. We'll see you tomorrow as well. And uh, with that, everybody enjoy your rest of your evening, rest of your week. Have a good night and take care.